Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, hello everyone. Je suis extrêmement heureux de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour cette nouvelle conférence virtuelle de l'initiative IA Société. I am delighted to welcome you today for a new AN Society uh, virtual talk. For those who don't know me, my name is Florent Martin Barito. I am an associate professor of law, the University Research Chair in Technology and Society, uh, and the director of the AN Society initiative at the University of, uh, of Ottawa. Uh, for today's virtual talk, we have teamed up with um, the Law Commission of Ontario and the Conway Professionalism Speaker Series to bring to you a conversation on how chat GPT and generative AI may impact the Canadian legal profession and legal service delivery. Thanks to the Conway Professionalism Speaker Series, this program has been approved for one professionalism hour for members of the Law Society of Ontario. We are grateful to the Ottawa Law Firm Conway Baxter Wilson LLP for their support for this series, which help us bring great events like today's discussion to all of you. For today's conversation, uh, I'm joined by Amy Salazin, Dan Lina, Colin Lachance, Ryan Fritz, and Nye Thomas. Um, quick presentation of, uh, of our speakers today. So first, Dr. Amy Salazin is an associate professor in the Faculty of Law Common Law Section at the University of Ottawa and a faculty member at the Centre for Law, Tech and Society and one of Canada's leading experts in the area of legal ethics, lawyer regulation, and the use of technology in the delivery of legal services and access to justice. Um, Dan Lina uh, I, is from uh, Northwestern. He has a joint appointment at Northwestern Spritzer School of Law and at the McCormick School of Engineering, uh, where he's teaching and with, uh, where he's teaching and research focus on innovation and technology, including computational law, AI, and data uh, analytics. We will also hear from Colin Lachance, who is a Canadian legal uh, entrepreneur who more recently launched a legal AI startup, uh, Jurisvage. Uh, you will also hear from Ryan Fritz, who is a counsel with the Law Commission of Ontario, where he notably leads a uh, law reform project, including one on AI and the criminal justice system. And last but not least, uh, this conversation will be moderated by <coughs> Nye Thomas, who is the executive director of the Law Commission of Ontario, where he notably leads projects on AI in the justice system, consumer protection, protection orders, uh, and environmental accountability. Without further ado, I will hand it over to uh, to now, will present you uh, uh, today's uh, conversation. Thank you again for, for joining us. Thank you, Florian. Um, just by way of introduction, um, the Law Commission of Ontario is a uh, law reform agency located at Osgoode Hall Law School in Toronto. Our interest in AI stems from a project we've been doing for the last couple of years on how to regulate AI, and in particular, how to regulate to ensure compliance with human rights and due process obligations and to ensure that uh, systems are legally accountable. The topic for today, however, is chat GPT and related technologies. Um, we will be using a Q&A format with our panelists, uh, incorporating a lot of the questions that were submitted to us in advance. Um, before we get into the panel, however, we're gonna start with a short video uh, that the Law Commission has put together, just to give people, uh, it's really a primer, just to give people a sense of what chat GPT looks like, what it feels like, how fast it is, and to introduce some of the issues that we're going to be talking about in our in our panel discussions afterwards. So with that, um, Melissa, if we could run the video, then we'll return after that for our panel discussion. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Ryan from the Law Commission of Ontario uh, with a quick introduction to ChatGPT and what it means for the practice of law in Canada. I'll give you a little background, then we'll see how ChatGPT does with four practical legal problems. It's honestly pretty amazing that we're even asking these questions. ChatGPT has barely been around for four months, but already it's got 100 million users. It's literally the fastest growing internet application in history. What are people doing with it? Everything. ChatGPT can generate just about any kind of text from a simple typed prompt. It's like sending a text message. In seconds, ChatGPT will respond and generate whatever you've asked for. That could be sonnets, undergraduate essays, family eulogies, children's stories, or a summary of your physics homework. ChatGPT appears able to do it all. A lot of people hope that ChatGPT can do it for legal questions too. 
Canada has a huge access to justice gap for millions of people with everyday legal problems. There's a lot of hope that ChatGPT can level the playing field and provide mass access to justice. For instance, ChatGPT could tell a layperson if they have a case or not, acting as a kind of quick legal self-assessment. ChatGPT could also draft materials for court. It'll, it'll even quote case law and legislation. This could help people who don't have lawyers to make a good case. It could generate legal documents like wills, a divorce settlement, a custody agreement, or employment contracts, saving people time and money. American advocates have even proposed using ChatGPT to speak live answers to litigants in court, right in their earbuds. So ChatGPT has a lot of promise for access to justice, but is it yet practical? The model has some weaknesses, and this is where the hope hits reality. ChatGPT uses a neural network called the Large Language Model, or LLM. LLMs use statistics to correlate words into phrases and phrases into paragraphs. Scaled up, this can generate entire texts in seconds. It looks human-made, but only because of its training. ChatGPT LLM is based on over 300 billion words scraped from the internet and parsed by neural networks. They identify 175 billion different parameters. Unsurprisingly, a lot of those parameters also work for legal questions. In fact, when some professors brought ChatGPT to school at the University of Minnesota Faculty of Law, it got a C-plus average on a couple of exams and essay assignments. Not bad, but is it good enough? Critics worry that the model can give incomplete or misleading information. So let's check out a couple of examples. Let's start with an easy one. Can I get fired for being pregnant? ChatGPT gives you an okay answer to this question and says, yep, that's discrimination. It's pretty generic advice, but it does point you in the right direction. As long as you specify Canada, you can get some quick and very general advice. The default is otherwise American law. ChatGPT can do follow-up questions too. So if I think I've been discriminated against, how do I file a human rights application? It's a procedural question and ChatGPT can help with that. ChatGPT's answer is technically correct, but it misses the big picture. A human lawyer would tell you to go to the Human Rights Legal Support Center. They can give you free advice, prepare documents, and provide advocacy services too. That's a much better option than self-representing. You might also be a bank employee. Even if you live in Ontario, you'd have to file a human rights complaint with the federal tribunal. ChatGPT doesn't ask about that, so it's got a jurisdictional blind spot. More nuanced legal questions get even more muddled. For instance, you could try asking ChatGPT about eligibility for MAID. That's medical assistance in dying. Federal law has been on the books since 2016. But if you get specific and ask about eligibility related to disabilities, ChatGPT only gives a legally generic answer. It sounds plausible, but it's three years out of date, legally speaking. ChatGPT can also generate documents, like a residential tenancy agreement. It looks convincing, but it contains almost no details about Ontario law. Instead, the simple standard form agreement that the tribunal provides has prompts for all kinds of legal rights, like which type of housing you're in, what utilities or services are included in the rent, and it tells you about limits on extra fees that landlords can charge, and a whole bunch more. ChatGPT doesn't have any of that kind of information. And what about people who want to do their own legal research? These days, that's a badge of honor, and ChatGPT could make it easier and more sophisticated, but not so much in practice. One law professor asked for articles on a legal question. ChatGPT gave him over a dozen articles that looked good, and each one was fully cited. The only problem? The professor's research assistant couldn't find any of the articles. ChatGPT had made them all up. Lawyers are noting that ChatGPT is also making up cases to fit the question. AI developers call this a hallucination. A self-represented litigant would call it a disaster in the making. So it's unlikely that ChatGPT will replace lawyers, at least not yet. So that leaves this panel with a lot to discuss today. What are the promises and pitfalls of the technology? How are lawyers using it? And is it helping? And finally, is there potential for ChatGPT to improve access to justice for millions? Or is that still a dream? Let's go to the panel and find out. Thank you, Ron. If I can ask all the panelists to um, come back on screen, please. Great, I think we're still waiting for Colin. Colin, are you with us?
I think okay. we're Let missing me... Colin is having a difficulties. Maybe you can start the conversation. We're going to try to bring him back. Sure. OK, um, Dan, I'll start with you then and we'll flip back to Colin when when he gets back on. And um, we've had a lot of questions around how the technology has been used by law firms. Um, so if you could just give us a bit of a heads up as to how the technology has been used, um, what it's good for, what are its risks, and then uh, we'll kind of start the conversation there. Sure, I created just a couple of slides to step through while talking about this. Um, I anticipated that I'd be following Colin, but I think I can set this up to at least think about the ways in which this is being used currently. So some of the things ChatGPT can do is generate text in response to a prompt, revise writing, summarize text, generate ideas, answer, answer questions in a convincing language, although it might not have a connection to the uh, ground truth, to underlying facts, maintain a conversation, and it's being used to write and debug code. And one of the things that we wanna make clear during this whole session is that ChatGPT is just one computational technology. In fact, it's just one type of large language model. There's a lot of other large language models that OpenAI has uh, created for use in which, in fact, a lot of law firms and, and legal aid organizations are already using, uh, but there's a lot of other tools out there. Now, one of the things you're gonna hear a lot about is that sometimes, th this is direct text from OpenAI, sometimes ChatGPT gives plausible sounding but incorrect or nonsensical answers. And you've probably already seen a lot of examples on, of this if you've been uh, on social media. But there's a solution to this problem. And the solution is that for the legal tasks that we wanna do, we simply need to give ChatGPT and large language models the facts. If we give it a contract and ask it to analyze or ask questions about the contract or compare that contract to a playbook that we already have, these tools are very good at helping us analyze and figure out if the contract meets our requirements, whether it's a particular choice of law, choice of forum, uh, indemnification provision, things like that. Um, so we can point it at deposition transcripts, collections of documents, things like that. And these large language models can be very helpful in analyzing, revising, um, documents. So what other kind of use cases are we seeing? Uh, summarizing law, court opinions, contracts, and other documents. You can imagine having a corpus of deposition transcripts or, or uh, other documents for a litigation matter, for example, and, and using a tool like ChatGPT or another large language model to help you understand, summarize what's there, uh, generate questions that you might ask in a, in a deposition. We're seeing a lot of really interesting use cases for analyzing and revising contracts, um, drafting patent applications, uh, different litigation documents like complaints, answers, briefs, uh, and analyzing legal briefs and memos, helping us think about how we could improve the writing in, in those documents, including introductions and point headings and things like that. It's also very good at doing things like drafting press releases and other communications. This is where this tool is incredibly good, where you don't have specific ground truth facts that you need to be have incorporated into uh, what you're trying to produce. And we're seeing use cases for, for legal research. Uh, and then I'm also very interested in the access to justice space, thinking about how we can improve chatbot dialogue. And this isn't limited to just access for, to justice. You could think inside of a corporation, for example, a corporate legal department having a chatbot that could answer basic questions and make sure those questions are answered consistently so people across the organization get proper legal guidance. Uh, something else we should talk about is that it's very sensitive to tweaks in the input phrasing. And so you may have heard discussions about prompt engineering. So the exact way that you ask the question is very important. And in fact, what we're seeing is that asking these questions is more than just asking the question that's actually becoming a way of natural language programming these systems. Uh, so to me, the benefits, the promise is it can really transform the way we practice law. And right, there are a lot of questions about, is this gonna eliminate lawyer jobs? And I think that's the wrong question. The question is, is when are we going to use these tools to transform the way that we think about legal services, legal systems, and rule of law in society? And so there are huge opportunities. But I think it's really important to note that technology is just one piece of, of innovation. And I like to frame it often in terms of people process data technology. These systems really depend on data. And uh, quite a few law firms and legal departments have been investing time, uh, investing resources in improving their data and uh, making sure they understand what are the highest quality 
types of different documents we have and, and things like that in the organizations. And those are the organizations that are really going to do the best with this. So it's not just the technology. Um, it's understanding these other aspects of it and understanding these other professionals, legal operations, knowledge management professionals, uh, and so on, who are helping transform the way we deliver legal services. A, a shortcoming in this space is that we don't have great standards for measuring the quality of the things we do as lawyers and legal services. So if I show you two contracts, we can debate which one is the better contract, but we don't have benchmarks for that. And that's gonna become more and more important as we use these technology tools to draft contracts and things like that. So we really need to, to think about being more evidence-based in what we do as lawyers and come up for ways to, uh, to measure the quality and value other things that we do. So I've been working on this a little bit and I think we're gonna see more and more people developing checklists, toolkits and other resources to help us think about how we can develop, deploy and evaluate these tools for many different types uh, of use cases. Um, I'm doing some experiments, been doing some randomized controlled trials around this uh, in the chatbot space, for example, to ask questions about not just can these chatbots give accurate answers, but how can we use something like ChatGPT to augment the rules of landlord-tenant law in this case to actually really connect with an end user and uh, come through with the sort of empathy that you, under, to match the empathy that the client comes to the, the situation uh, with and, and really kind of create this first class uh, opportunity to improve access to justice. And we're doing projects like this in our in our innovation lab at Northwestern. We've got eight projects this year and half of them are on generative AI. So we've got a lot of partners who are really excited about the opportunities in this space. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is you know, just a couple of, of challenges. ChatGPT itself, you absolutely should not be putting confidential information in the ChatGPT. So this is one of the problems. We don't know exactly where that's going when we enter into ChatGPT, but there are other systems we can design. There are other tools that we can use where we have, we know actually what's happening or we can confine that information just to the, the our side when we're uh, using and developing these systems so we don't have confidentiality concerns. Uh, and then something else that we need to keep talking about is concerns about bias in these systems. ChatGPT was trained on a huge corpus of language across the internet. Some of that language is language that we don't want part of our legal system. Um, and so OpenAI put some guardrails around these systems, but we still need to do some more evaluation and testing, uh, particularly in high impact areas, to make sure that these systems are gonna work well for everyone in society. Uh, you can think of these, these tools as kind of uh, confined to consistent with the norm, right? Uh, but you know we don't want tools that only work for the norm in society. We want them to work for all groups across society for things like thinking about developing a chatbot that can be used for legal services. So I'll stop there, Nai. Okay, let me just ask you a follow-up question. Like what are the um, likely benefits for clients? You know, um, are legal services likely to be faster, less expensive, um, you know, more accurate, more more user friendly? What what are what benefits long term can clients anticipate from from the technology? Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot of these technologies really empower individuals. So if you're an individual in society and you have a problem with your landlord, right, you're going to have more tools that really can understand your situation and what you need to do and help you draft a demand letter or request for your return of your security deposit. And I think we'll see more of this in corporations as well. If I need a non-disclosure agreement, there are going to be tools to help me in the business to be able to do self-service. And I think you know we, we're gonna see a reduction of variance in the way we do things as lawyers. So in the contract space, one of the things that I'm seeing is more and more attention to, we have a playbook, this is the way we want our contracts to look, but we're also seeing more and more data gathering about what do we really need to get from our contracts, right? And it's not just the boilerplate language necessarily that we negotiate, but thinking about, well, how quickly can we get the contract negotiated? Can we learn from past negotiations so we can set up a contract from the beginning in a way that we think makes sense given the counterparty and, and, and the market at that given time, so we can get contracts entered into more quickly, we can reduce long-term disputes based on the data we have about how to put the contracts together, things like that. Okay, let me open it up to Amy and Ryan if they have any questions or comments um, on what Dan has talked about so far. Sure, I, I think Dan gave a great overview. Um, you know, one thing, people are talking about ChatGPT quite a bit. That's why we have such a large audience with us today. I know at, at a recent major American um, tech conference, the ABA Tech Show, 
Um, one of the panelists, you know, said that ChatGPT was the most important innovation since the internet and the iPhone. Um, I'm not as bullish as that, um, and I, I, I can understand where that excitement's from. You've heard about so many use cases, um, just in what Dan had talked about. I think one thing that's helpful to know is a lot of us got introduced to this type of technology by seeing ChatGPT, maybe playing with it. ChatGPT is just, and Dan made this point, one particular tool, an AI chatbot tool, that's built on top of a large language model. As we see lawyers starting to get excited about this type of technology, the use cases we're seeing aren't lawyers just plugging and playing chat BT into their legal practices. There's gonna be a lot of problems if you try and do this. Confidentiality, we know that chat GPT will just make up cases. But what they're doing is using the underlying GPT-3 or 3.5 technology to build certain tools, build tools like Collins Company, building a tool that can help you chat with cases and extract information, building tools that can help summarize um, information. Um, some large law firms are kind of building and using all-purpose assistance to help kind of communicate um, with clients, all, all sorts of things like that. But those tools aren't, again, chat be GPT just plugged into a law firm. They're bespoke tools that are built with certain types of guardrails. They're confined in what information they're looking at. Sometimes they have firewalls built on, onto them to protect client confidentiality. So I think it's important to make that distinction. We see these law firms starting to use these tools, what they're actually using. On top of what Dan said, I, you know, we've also seen this being used or potentially used for legislative drafting. I, I think he mentioned marketing. Um, there's one judge that made a lot of headlines for using it to generate a judicial decision. Um, so we're really just, I think, at the beginning of seeing where this will go. I think, you know, there are some question marks about how revolutionary this is, but it, this isn't kind of one simple tool. We're seeing a, a technology that's become more powerful um, and allowed for natural language processing and extracting information. And we're seeing a lot of interesting use cases. And so we're at the beginning of this story, and I think it's going to be exciting to see where it goes. Um, but um, yeah. Uh, I'll turn it over to maybe Ryan if you want to add anything to, to what I just said. Well, one thing I wanted to pick up on that uh, Dan mentioned, I think, is a, a really legitimate concern for access to justice uh, in using these tools. Obviously, these tools are really uh, seductive uh, because people have a lot of difficulty getting legal answers to everyday um, legal problems. But as Dan pointed out, um, these models are trained off language, scraped off the Internet. And that language can reflect social biases. So there's a danger, I think, in particularly vulnerable groups relying on these kinds of tools uh, and the kinds of advice um, that they're given. I know, for example, that today is uh, International Women's Day. And I wonder um, how much of the language that uh, the chat GPT training program scraped off the Internet you know, reflects the interests of women. Uh, for example, uh, if I ask chat GPT, what I can do if I've been a victim of assault. You know, ChatGPT might not give me information that's relevant to women. It might be sort of generic information about, well, you can go to the police and make a complaint and so forth. Um, but if I'm a victim of domestic violence, you know, I want to know where I can find a shelter. Uh, I want to know how I can extract myself from a violent relationship um, safely. So I think those are the kinds of gaps that we see between the kinds of generic answers that you get from something like ChatGPT uh, and the difference in actually going to a lawyer uh, and actually uh, trying to get uh, good legal advice. You know, just if I can jump in on that too, I think I do, and I am concerned about this. I think it's important to recognize that the status quo isn't so great either, right? So we have a lot of bias and, and problems in our systems now. And although I think what the promise is, is that these systems can help us improve from the status quo. So we just want to be careful that we don't implement these systems and repeat problems of the past. Uh, train, you know, if we have biased training data, we're going to get, you know, garbage in, garbage out. We're, we're going to see that. But I think there's a lot of potential here to improve greatly beyond where we're at. And, and some of the issues are more subtle, kind of like, okay, we think these systems actually work pretty well, but you know what, have we tested, what if you're a non-native speaker of English, for example, like how well does it work? And we, we just need to do testing. A lot of this is basic software design kind of stuff. And just unfortunately, sometimes in the rush to get product to market, it's not happening the way that it should. So I'm confident we can solve these problems. We just have to pay attention to them. So Dan, let me ask you one um, further question around you know, use of the technology by firms and whether or not, uh, you know, you work in a big firm, 
you're in New York, you're in Toronto, you're an international firm, you've got the capacity to create these bespoke tools that Amy was talking about. But what about a, you know, a small firm, a sole practitioner? Is there a differential impact uh, uh, kind of stratifying the practice even more so than it is now um, due to um, uneven access to the technology? Is that, a, is that a risk? There's a risk, but I think there's far more opportunity here because I think we're seeing more and more. I mean, you can sign up for an API and start using these different chat GPT tools right, right now, right? Chat GPT and other GPT models. Um, now, if you're a larger firm and you have a team of, I think we're going to see more and more computer scientists and data scientists and designers and other people hired, right? So you may have some advantages there. Um, it's also more difficult to kind of maneuver the ship, right? And get everyone in, in, engaged. And where are you going in a larger law firm? If you're a smaller boutique firm, there are more and more technology tools that are available. You're not going to be able to create your own large language models or do heavy duty training like they might be able to do in a really large firm. But there are all sorts of opportunity for smaller firms here to be very strategic and think about what is it that we do and we do well, how can we create a unique value proposition? Um, and I think that's one of the big questions here. I hear a lot of firms saying like, oh, we're going to use our specific contracts and we're going to train one of these GPT models and we're going to do, you know, our firm version of some contract or some service. And, you know, there might be some opportunities there doing that, but I'm not so sure about that. Uh, you know, in the long haul, I think we'll be more see more and more convergence, uh, more and more of these things will turn into sort of commodities and lawyers will have to think carefully about like, what is it that I really do to add value and and smaller boutique firms, solo practitioners, they'll have access to a lot of these different tools and tremendous opportunities to provide value. Okay, thank you. Um, Colin, have you rejoined us? Uh, yes, I have. Thanks. Okay, we're going to. Flip back to our original order, and um, I want to ask Colin about, um, you know, Amy made the point, Dan made the point, ChatGPT is just kind of the best known application um, of a broad category of, of technology, sometimes called generative AI. What do, uh, but that's just one application, it's kind of the best known one. What do people, and more specifically lawyers, need to know about the underlying technology um, to help them understand uh, the opportunities, the debate, and kind of where we're where we're coming from. Sure, uh, thanks, Mai, and and uh, let me know if I start covering areas that Dan had already touched on. But the key thing to uh, appreciate about the underlying technology is that it's largely about having the context of information and retaining it uh, inside the model as it's processing your commands. So I'll. I'll break that into pieces. What, what these models can do is to basically be aware of a certain number of characters or tokens at a point in time. So they're engaging with language and using that to move forward. So it's not search, it's not knowledge. It's basically saying, what can I know now that I'm aware of the last you know, X number of words, the current context limit is what's called 4,000 tokens or you know, roughly 3,000 words. So when you're dealing with uh, these models, what you're essentially dealing with is something that knows 3,000 words at a time. So when you're giving it context for a question that you're asking, you can keep that context up. Uh, when you're asking it to go searching, it's not drawing from a particular knowledge bank. It's drawing from, uh, as you saw in the video, as folks saw in the videos at, at the outset, it's, it's statistically gathering what the next likely word is. So because it's drawing from language in that way, it's it, it falls short, I think, of some of the expectations that we're beginning to put on it. And and I, here I want to differentiate between Chat GPT specifically and these underlying models. The the underlying models are are really about how much can we expect of a question answer tool when we can only feed it so much knowledge at at any given point in time. And that's really what what folks are working at. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> excuse me, underneath. And so I just caught the tail end of Dan talking about contracts and so on. So these models don't know contracts, but they know what chunks of 1,000 or 3,000 words of a contract might look like. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm not going too far afield. Uh, so I'm going to stop here for a second and, and just check in. Uh, now, I have, folks already covered uh, some of the other aspects about uh, 
different suppliers other than OpenAI? No, we haven't, no. Okay. So, uh, large language models uh, are, are built on transformer technology, and there are a lot of companies, Google among others, that have been working with transformer technology for a while. So, this is really as simple as saying, you know, we understand uh, text in, in sentence level, paragraph level, and, and larger level moving it forward. But the, the, the tech is being created by companies like Google, like uh, Cohere, Anthropic, this Hugging Face. There's all sorts of other uh, companies that are using these same underlying technology language models to build new tools and with, with new interfaces. So what we're experiencing right now with chat is one application, one way of engaging. But the, the, the tech is being bundled in other things, other more traditional approaches to machine learning and natural language processing into a you know, completely uh, open-ended range of, of potential apps that are leaning on their strengths, their facility and understanding language, but also cognizant of their limitations, how much language is being engaged at any point in time. Okay, got it. Um, let me... Um switch tact a little bit and talk about um, ethics and regulation. And Amy, uh, we had several questions um, submitted to us asking about the, um, well, I'll just read one. Um, will there be a risk of negligence if a lawyer does not consult with chat GPT? Which raises the question on, you know, what ethical issues does the technology rise? Uh, can you talk about professional competence? And then we'll talk about regulation after that. Sure. Well, the legal ethics professor me is happy to see people are asking about ethics and that's on people's minds. Um, yeah, there's a few intersections with professional obligations that I think lawyers need to be aware of. Uh, competence you talked about. Of course, lawyers have an obligation to provide competent legal services. Um, and hopefully it's clear in the, the, you know, the comments so far that a lawyer just simply opening up chat GPT on their computer and using that to funnel legal advice directly to a client is going to get into a lot of trouble pretty fast. You may have made up cases, you may have, you know, inaccuracies of the law. Um, this tool can maybe give you a C plus on a law exam, but, you know, a C plus on advising a client and having 20% of that legal answer being wrong is, is pretty significant. And then Dan also raised that the huge issue with confidentiality, this information is absolutely not private that you're entering into chat GPT. Again, there's bespoke tools that are using some of the same underlying large language models that are a completely different story in terms of what they can do for reliability, what they can do for confidentiality. Um, and I think in some cases, those, those can be used to help lawyers deliver competent legal services. Um, the question you raised, uh, Nye, talks about kind of maybe the flip side of that question is, when does not using one of these tools maybe become a matter of incompetence? Um, when I was thinking about that question, it reminded me of a quote I saw um, from a 2010 case from a, a judge in Alberta, and he had said, you know, in 2010, the practice of law has evolved to a point where computerized legal research is no longer a matter of choice. So, of course, at one point in time, we're using print reporters to do computerized research. Now it's recognized that using a particular type of technology to do a particular type of legal task isn't a choice. It's a matter of basic competence. And, and there's no reason to think we're not going to hit that tipping point with other sorts of tools. We aren't there with uh, these, these tools built on large language models yet. That doesn't mean we won't ever um, get there. Um, in some of the previous comments, the issue of efficiency was also raised. I think now you talked about benefits for lawyers. Well, efficiency it, this is sometimes missed, is actually an ethical obligation for Canadian lawyers. You have in the rules clearly stated an obligation to provide efficient legal services. So again, there's a question that, you know, if there is a tool that has sufficient reliability but can make you do something much, much, much faster, think about kind of the, the technology-assisted review and e-discovery. You know, is there a point where using that tool is part of your obligation to provide efficient legal services? Again, there's going to be a tipping point potentially where we hit that. Um, last point on ethics, I maybe would just mention due diligence. So lawyers, both kind of at common law and in the rules, maintain responsibility for the product they're putting out there, whether they're delegating to humans or delegating to machines. Um, and as you know, we start to have more of these tools available, potentially even cheaper to develop, more people excited. They, they're reading in Forbes that legal is a great market to tap and they're gonna you know, use this API to develop their own tool. 
lawyers are going to need to know which tools are reliable and which tools are good if they're going to start incorporating that into their practice they're going to have responsibility over that and so there's a due diligence point there as well um, that lawyers need to make sure that they they know what they're using when they're using it okay let me ask you another think, question from the audience oh i'm sorry um I and that is will the yeah, I was just going to add now to uh, build on uh, Amy's point there that um, I think the use of tools like uh, ChatGPT and other tools uh, does raise concerns with uh, issues of professional competence, but it also then raises uh, corollary issues of fairness uh, among all of the litigants, particularly self-represented litigants. I think there's some concern that uh, we could end up very soon with a set of two-tier tools, you know, the free tools that are freely available online. Uh, and tools that are paid that might be more tailored to uh, addressing legal issues and providing better, more co coherent and reliable answers. You know, if we get into that situation, you've got a situation where um, folks who can afford those tools show up to court, even as self-represented litigants, with better information, a stronger and possibly more compelling argument. So there's an access to justice here issue where we need to be able to make these tools available to all litigants. And in fact, we're starting to see some case law reflect this, where uh, now access to already closed uh, legal database systems like uh, Westlaw, you know, those are having to open themselves up to uh, self-represented litigants so that they have equal access to quality information uh, when they show up in court. Yeah, okay. Um, let me, um, we'll return to that um, theme in a moment. Um, Amy, let me put another question to you that, that uh, was, was provided to us. Will the providers of legal AI ultimately be considered to be delivering a legal service that must be regulated by the law side of Ontario, law side of Alberta? You know, can this stuff be regulated? And how, if so, how do regulators, how should regulators respond? Yeah, great question. And so here, I think it's important to distinguish between two different sets of tools. So a lot of what we've talked about today are what we might call legal tech tools. So tools that would be used by a lawyer to assist them in their legal practice. And those tools, I wouldn't think would be considered to be engaging in the practice of law any more than using a legal research tool that are already empowered by AI or using you know, technologically assisted research. Um, so those, those, again, are just tools that lawyers use. Of course, they need to use them competently. If they don't, they can be regulated by the law societies. They don't do their due diligence. I mean, I do think law studies could have a and do have an important role, even with those sorts of tools, whether it's, you know, helping lawyers understand how to use this technology ethically and competently. So things like best practices. I know the Law Society of Ontario has opened up a technology research cent resource center. That's great. Some people have talked about law societies even generating kind of a registry of lists of tools that they maybe haven't accredited, but at least have done their own due diligence on so lawyers can know what to use. So there can be a role for law societies. Um, when we start kind of talking about um, regulating the, the tools themselves, um, where that kind of really comes into place and you have what I call, some people call direct-to-consumer, I call them direct-to-public tools. So if you had an AI chatbot put on the market and said, hey, ask whatever robot name, we'll provide you legal advice. In that case, that is, you know, starts becoming under the law society's mandate. It's providing legal services. Assuming it's not something just giving general legal information. And there, you know, law societies are starting to look at how they can engage with these tools, whether it's in their sandbox programs that we have in a few different law societies. But there, there is a huge, you know, public protection um, issue. Um, these tools can give very confidently sounding answers that are completely inaccurate. And if, and if public is getting you know, legal advice and acting on it that's inaccurate, that can that can create a lot of real harms. And so there is a role there, but that, again, we have to kind of distinguish between what type of tool we're talking about and, and who's using this. Is there a lawyer intermediary or not? But I think we'll have to wait and see kind of where the technology develops and and what legal regulators are going to need, need to do. Yeah. Dan, let me actually follow up on that. And if you know about um legal regulation of these tools in the states? Are there, you know, early efforts to regulate? I mean, are, 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 are you know, the, there are a million legal regulators in the states. Uh, what are some of the approaches that are being thought about uh, currently? 
Yeah, well, I think there's been some interesting changes uh, in Utah, for example. There's a, a regulatory sandbox, and we're seeing tools introduced and and um, new service models being introduced there. And so there's a lot of data being gathered. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the approach in most jurisdictions has been to uh, you know use the unauthorized practice of law as really you know to to push legal tech companies out of uh, serving this space and so that's been quite unfortunate and so I do worry a little bit about um, over eager uh, bar associations trying to regulate these tools and whether they're actually well equipped to regulate these tools I agree absolutely with like with Amy's point that there's a role to be played here right um, I think there's also this idea that if the bar is not regulating these tools they're not regulated at all and of course that's not the case there's uh, there's you know the Federal Trade Commission there's other you know state agencies that are that are looking over to, to, to protect consumers so the, the bar and lawyers have a role but I think unfortunately we need to know more and more of the leaders to say we need to be embracing these tools and thinking about how to make sure there's a marketplace for innovation and for other organizations to come in uh, and deliver good, you know, services that actually serve people well. I think there's a, a, a question connected to this that we have to think carefully about, and that is that you know, the rules that we develop in this area, how are those going to apply to legal aid organizations and nonprofits as well? Uh, because you know, they're delivering legal services in this space. And so I think we have to you know, think about uh, the whole marketplace generally and, and what many different service providers can contribute here to improve access to justice for everyone. You uh, read my mind because the last topic mm -hmm. we're going to talk about is um, access to justice. And um, Ryan, uh, you've talked about some access to justice issues so far, but can you talk a little bit about the potential? There's an access to justice in Canada as there is in the United States. Um, we all know it. Um, can you talk a little bit about the potential of some of the technology to um, address at least some of uh, our access to justice problems? And then I'll ask you about the risks after that. Sure, Nye. Um I think it's probably appropriate to start with sort of first principles, though, and, and that is that there is a massive access to justice gap uh, in Canada. Millions of people cannot get answers to legal questions uh, that arise uh, in the everyday. I mean, that's the reality right now. So one thing that's really interesting, I think, about uh, chat GPT uh, is that, you know, we always thought that AI wouldn't replace humans until AI was as good as humans. Uh, chat GPT is clearly not as good as humans, um, but there's a massive demand for it. Um, so, in fact, the demand is not being driven by the technology in a sense. It's being driven by economics, the economic <laughs> barriers that people have to uh, accessing, um, uh, accessing justice. Um, I think right now what we see from ChatGPT, at least these sort of freely available and publicly available tools, is that it's kind of good uh, at identifying and pointing you in kind of the general direction. And that actually has a lot of value for a lot of people. Um, folks don't know what their legal rights might be. They don't know sort of what ballpark they might be playing in with a particular uh, concern. So the fact that this thing is sort of able to triage and act as a little bit of uh, issue identification um, is really helpful. And we're seeing um, those kinds of tools being implemented in places like British Columbia, where they have uh, an online civil resolution tribunal now uh, that can actually guide people through the process of resolving issues related to car crash injuries, landlord tenant disputes, uh, condo disputes, and, and other things like that. So putting chat GPT or a tool like that at the front end of that process uh, could potentially help a lot. Uh, and it could actually scale up not only the number of people uh, able to use those kinds of systems, but also improve like the results and the information that they're getting, which is good. Um, I also think too, you don't wanna think about uh, access to justice just as access to dispute resolution. One uh, option that uh, ChatGPT gives us now is that um, you know, certain people could be empowered with ChatGPT and that could avoid the need to raise uh, issues. And I think about, for example, accommodation in the workplace. Uh, if I, as an employee, am able to use it and I have a disability or a, uh, I come from a different linguistic community, I might be able to use a tool like ChatGPT as a workplace accommodation. Uh, so I don't have to file a complaint uh, or go to a human rights tribunal or argue with my uh, employer. Um, so I think uh, I think those are the kinds of examples where these kinds of tools could actually help uh, avoid legal problems. The only thing I want to uh, just conclude with is, you know, two points of two points of warning. Um, the first is that 
the demand for tools like ChatGPT is uh, inarguable, and the need is also inarguable. But I don't think we want to resile too far um, from ensuring that uh, access to justice is both cheap and fast and good, right? We have to make sure that the advice that people are getting is still good and to a professional standard. Uh, making tools like this available can't be a tick box exercise. You can't just say, oh, you've got chat GPT now, so you've got access to justice. No, we have to make sure it's sort of along the lines Amy was saying and Dan were saying that these tools are effective for people and providing good, meaningful uh, information. The last point um, is that there's a danger to laypersons, I think, in using this because chat GPT is an information tool different from anything they've ever seen before. When I go to Google and do a search for something, Google gives me results, not answers. And as a person, I can parse through those results. I can look at the context of who's providing the information, who the author is, and I can make choices about which information I rely on, and I can see related information. ChatGPT doesn't give you results. It gives you answers. Uh, so it doesn't have context. It doesn't automatically connect you to those kinds of uh, related areas. And as a result, I think it can result in people sort of getting uh, tunnel vision uh, and over relying on the tool without knowing that there could be a broader uh, issue there. So um, as with many things, considerable promise and some troublesome aspects. Uh, and um, Nye, can I jump in on Ryan's yeah. point that the last point yes, there? Yes, I, 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 sorry, I, I agree he's correct that, that ChatGPT can't do those things, provide the context, provide uh, uh, validation, focus on the, on the correct information. But those who build can introduce those kinds of guardrails. So increasingly we're seeing standalone tools that allow site owners, so like a public legal education and information site, to actually apply chat GPT into its own site to, to use as a, a much more intelligent chatbot <coughs> to allow people to explore their own site. Similarly on, on things like search, whether it's Google or Bing or a, a legal research database, there, there's, there is the ability uh, for the, 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 the service provider to take the, the benefits of the language model and marry them with the accuracy of, of other things to say that this document is worth more than that document, this paragraph is more important than that paragraph relative to the issue. So there's a combination of factors. Like, you know, I can say as someone who's been building with the underlying technologies, it's an, a really powerful wrench if you know where and when to use a wrench. So relying on, on ChatGPT specifically to achieve these things, unlikely but as more people find ways to combine it with the the specific domain expertise that they have the specific use case that they're trying to apply it's actually increasingly easier and cheaper to to make this happen the the underlying technology dropped by a factor of 20 over the past six months uh from, from where it was last september so and the performance has gone way up making it accessible to even the smallest organizations to uh, layer it onto their particular area of expertise yeah, that's a good point. Um, any, um, Amy, Dan, any quick uh, comments on the access to justice issue? Anything you haven't already said? Um, maybe just quickly. I mean, I think just like, like a lot of the points that were made today, I think the comments that we just had to show the importance of not kind of not talking in in absolutes. Um, and you know, one thing I've said, I think Mary, what Ryan, the point Ryan's point made is we have to be wary of kind of a let them have bots attitude um, and understand that, you know, even if we have really powerful tools and even have some of the, the tailored and more bespoke tools that the con was talking about, obviously, our hope, obviously, there, there's going to be situations, particularly with very vulnerable people, where they actually need full representation by a human lawyer. And so just keeping that in mind, that doesn't mean that there's no access to justice potential. We have to think about targeted uses. We have to think about sophisticated uses. We have to understand what the needs are and where are those opportunities where we can help people? Because like Ryan said, the need is so profound. Um, but again, we can't say that now we have a panacea and we can kind of give everybody their own robot lawyer. No, and, and even with the most sophisticated technology, there's many reasons why that's not gonna be what helps people. Lawyering is more than just generating language. Um, it's, it's, it, there's a human element, there's an emotional intelligence element. And so, again, it's not, not thinking in absolutes, I think, is, is always an important thing to fall back on. Yeah. Dan, and I'll just, word. 
Yeah, I'll just, I mean, I think there's huge opportunity in this space, but we can't forget about other types of tools. A lot of the chatbots and, and document assembly expert systems that have been developed are just as relevant today. And I think there's huge potential there. And then you can think about how you can use dialogue tools like, like ChatGPT, for example, to improve, again, the connection with the end users, make sure you understand really what the, the problem is, deliver the, you know, the advice. I think Ryan's point is about preventing problems is a huge one as well. Uh, but, you know, I think we, we tend to be looking for the easy button in this whole space. And, you know, these tools are making it easier and easier, but there's still a lot of fundamental work about really asking questions about what it is we do as lawyers, how we solve problems, how we provide value, uh, you know, why so many people aren't unserved, th things like that. And, and so we have to invest more resources in thinking about how to develop tools that really solve problems that need to be solved. Yeah, I'll just add to that uh, and give myself the last word and just say, you know, the benefits of the technology aren't going to happen by themselves. It's going to require a lot of thought and uh, particularly on the access to justice front, a lot of work uh, from access to justice advocates and others to fashion the technology so that it helps um, as opposed to, you know, being another layer, um, you know, separating people from, uh, from, from their rights. And with that, um, Florian, I'm going to pass it back to you because I believe we are just about out of time. Now that's perfect timing. We're like at 1 p.m. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no, th thank you for this uh, great conversation. Thank you for everybody in attendance. Uh, sorry again for some of the technical uh, difficulties that, uh, that that we had uh, today, uh, but this will be recorded. Uh, this was recorded. This will be like, you know, made available uh, online. And so thank you again uh, to the Law Commission of Ontario and the Conway uh, Professionalism Speaker Series for the collaboration of this very uh, timely uh, issue. And I'm sure it's just the, the first event on, on the topic uh, as uh, AI assistance and uh, other tools or like, uh, permitting the legal industry uh, a bit more uh, every day. So thank you uh, again, um, everybody, and uh, have a lovely reminding uh, of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.